Howdy doody everyone, Wombu here, and today... Hi, wanna go lab? What, what, what the heck, Depus? Hi, wanna go lab? Okay, that's not how this works. We need to have a convoluted intro with plot tying into how the game works and... There doesn't have to be a story behind everything. We can just do things. Fair point. Laziest intro ever, but whatever. What do you have in mind? Spirit of Justice. Yes! So we start off with Phoenix traveling from San Francisco to Japandia, or Kurain, in order to do some sightseeing and go visit his former assistant, who's also a spirit medium, Maya, who need I remind you guys is amazing. He arrives to meet his tour guide, I'll be er guide. You'll be my guide? Why? No, Josh. I'll be er guide. Again, why do you want to be my guide? I'll be... Er guide. I know, but why though? His name is Albi Erguide. Oh, so who's on first? You're enjoying this joke way too much right now. Naturally, the two of them go see a performance of the Sacred Dance of Devotion, and not gonna lie, it's kind of cool. But while that's happening, living up to Phoenix's unimaginably stupid luck, Albi gets arrested for murder on the spot. Just, of course. Can't go one day without an innocent person being blamed for murder. Ugh, why does it always have to be murder? Why can't it be something like Grand Theft Auto, racketeering, drug <laughs> possession, or human trafficking? Wow. I didn't know you were so picky about your heinous crimes. It's called having standards, my boy. So Phoenix goes to attend Albie's trial to find that he has absolutely no one representing him, and a guilty verdict is already being handed down. So Phoenix, embodying the spirit of justice, oh my gosh, did I really just say that? Decides that this will not stand, and steps up to represent Albie. And then the other people in the trial are all, but this is our culture, and Phoenix is all, I don't like your culture, so we're doing this my way. You really articulate, you know that? Thanks. It was circus. <clears throat> Never mind. At this point, everyone acts really surprised and also really venomous. I'll be included. It turns out that Kurain hasn't actually had any defense attorneys for around 20 years. The reason for this is because Kurain has a law enacted called the Defense Culpability Act. What this means is that any punishment that's handed down to the defendant will also be applied to their defense attorney. And guess which punishment our good friend Albi is on the line for? Yep, right in the very first case, Phoenix's life is put on the line. Understandably, he has some hesitations about whether or not he should really go through with this, but then he remembers the reason he became a defense attorney in the first place, to help those in need. And I gotta say, this is a great way to start. Moments like these always give me hype. What about you, Wambu? You feeling hyped? Hype levels are sufficient. Then we can proceed! So Albi here has been accused of murdering a treasure guard known as Pat Roll. The person that stands to incriminate Albi the most is Rafa Padma Kurain, the royal priestess in Kurain, and the one with the ability to perform the divination seance. We are shown this game's next mechanic, Insight. It involves seeing the last memories of the dead and finding contradictions between Rafa's interpretation of the events and the victim's senses shown on the screen. To show you guys what it's all about, here's the first vision we get to see. Well, I'm convinced. Time to kill him. Dude, that's screwed up. He's like nine. Eh, whatever. Anyway, it's a really fun idea and beautifully presented in a way that cleverly complements the narrative. However, I get the feeling that the makers needed more practice with designing it or needed a scenario that would better complement the mechanics. See, most Phoenix Wright information gathering systems have one or two variables, as you can see here. Insight has three, 
With the addition of a third variable, the margin for error greatly increases. Now, because it was just introduced, it is relatively painless in the first case. In fact, it's kind of cool. But in future cases, it gets really frustrating. Oh, we'll get to that case later. Through Phoenix being Phoenix, he deftly picks apart the insights and actually gets Rafa thrown out. The trial proceeds like a normal Phoenix Wright case, slowly finding contradictions, a new witness is brought in who turns out to be the real killer, Payne is there, and he sucks. You know, first case stuff, despite the entire gallery constantly calling for Phoenix to be beheaded. We also know exactly who the culprit is. The players have eyes after all. However, peace, love, and understanding's transformation and freak out is one of the best in the series history. Heck, I even love this guy's testimony because he sings it, and he actually sings the correct amount of syllables. How do you know that? I sing it out loud. You're a very damaged man. Now before we move on, I just wanted to say, more than any other game in the franchise, the name puns are just the least subtle thing ever. Not like they were super hidden in other games, but I could at least imagine a name like Penny Nichols flying over some people's heads at first, but here, since the writers basically made up a new culture, the puns are barely even hidden anymore. Seriously, there's no way anyone could read the name Peace Lubbin' Onda Standin' without immediately seeing the pun. I know this is a huge nitpick, but it's something I couldn't help but notice regardless. So, after Phoenix wins the trial, he sends the entire country into a frenzy, and he's greeted by the Justice Minister, Inga Kurayin. He is not important yet, but he does introduce us to the Defiant Dragons, a group of insurgents looking to overthrow the Kurayin regime. Perfect time for us to cut to the US, where Apollo and Athena are doing a great job losing the office and letting Trucy get into trouble. Again. <sighs> and we'd like to give Princess Peach flack for being a damsel in distress. Hi! H hold on, hold on, back up a second, Josh. What? Oh yeah, Trucy was doing a magic show and accidentally killed somebody, supposedly, while performing the old sword in the coffin trick. So now the Wright and Co. Law Offices is being repossessed, and it's up to Apollo and Athena, but mostly Apollo, to save Trucy and the office. Oh, well, okay then. Definitely some unique stakes here. However, the rest of this case is, well... Skippable. I mean, it's not bad necessarily, but it doesn't connect to the overall plot at all, save for maybe the exchange between Phoenix and Apollo over the phone, where Phoenix is all, Apollo, you're a big lawyer now, you can do it. And of course it has Trucy getting into trouble again. Nayuda is the main prosecutor of this game, and he is pretty unlikable. Edgeworth was fun, Goto was charismatic, Blackwill was cool, but Nayuda... You just want to punch him in his placid face. That. Seriously, the dude's arrogance is unwavering, which is fine. He's the guy you spend most of the game going against. But even after he learns that the people he's trying to condemn to prison, or even death, are innocent, he maintains his holier-than-thou attitude, which kind of makes him seem apathetic. Don't get me wrong, a punchable character is great sometimes, especially if it's clearly intentional, as is the case with him. But the writers might have succeeded a little too well in making him a jerk, which makes the inevitable prosecutor redemption arc a little less powerful. Well, not that there isn't anything to like about this case, we got some more background on the Grimaria troupe, and the characters for the most part are fairly entertaining. You have a love-to-hate TMZ-like villain, a fun witness, and some interesting commentary on magicians here and there, but it's nothing too unique for Ace Attorney. At least there's some interesting curveballs thrown in about it, like the bunny lady actually being two bunny ladies, and the TMZ douche being a magical TMZ douche. Plus, there's his final jab at Trucy, which ends up really striking a nerve. Which also has absolutely no importance later on. Yo, true though. Congratulations, Trissy! You now get to be unimportant for the rest of the game. Now on to case number three. Did you say case number three? Yeah, is there anything wrong with that? No, of course not. So in this case, after two whole games, Phoenix finally gets to reunite with his former assistant, Maya, who is accused of murder. Oh, son of a b Maya, your waifu for laifu, but stop f***ing getting accused of murder. Stop it. Anywho, Maya is falsely accused of murdering somebody important 
yet again, is the worst of day job. This time, it's the high priest to roost in me. Oh my gosh, that one hurts. To back up a bit, Maya is supposed to perform the purification rite, which is also her final step to becoming a master of the channeling technique. While she and the high priest go up to the inner sanctum to do just that, everyone else stays slouched over, praying in the plaza of devotion. Phoenix manages to pull this off for a whopping 20 seconds before he obliterates his back and passes out. And when he wakes up, Oh, hey, Albie, what's up? The High Priest is dead and Maya got arrested. Okay, cool, back to bed. Wait, what? So yeah, they go up to the Inner Sanctum under Rafa's watchful eye to make sure that Phoenix is not up to his lying, loyally ways. This is where we meet... Okay, so how do I describe dads? Hmm. A more competent Dan Hibiki. Nailed it. We also meet Queen Garan for the first time. And, okay, the woman is intimidating. Up until now, we've seen this completely screwed up court system, which has inspired the most violent rhetoric, and this gentle, sweet, motherly figure is in charge. This is... something's fishy. Then we transition to the first trial, and as happy as I am to reunite with one of my favorite characters in the franchise, this case is unbelievably frustrating for a number of reasons. The first of many being this really dumb insight segment, and I know I'm not the only one who had problems with it. We can easily see the contradiction, but it's how to get it across that stupid. After that, Phoenix brings up the possibility of a third party at the Inner Sanctum and casts suspicion onto Dats, who at this point is being called a non Emus. <sighs> However, his name ends up getting cleared, and both Maya and Phoenix are actually declared guilty. Yeah, they lose the trial. But conveniently enough, someone else gets murdered. And who gets accused? That's two murder accusations in one case. Way to step up your game, Maya. <sighs> so anyway... Even though he's basically a few days away from dying, Phoenix decides to look into the murder of our new victim in a last stitch to prove Maya's innocence for two murders. Like last investigation, Rafa tags along, this time antagonizing Phoenix for how he's totally going to die and he's completely lost, but oh, what's this? A secret hideout that could change everything? Convenient! Then during trial numero dos, we get the idea to get the testimony from the dead man himself through Maya's channeling. This definitely turns the case on his head because he decides to be a dick and also blames Maya. But through some convolution with the Steel Samurai, you know, that thing from the first game that strangely still saves cases, Tarust's wife, Believe, confesses she killed Prey Zealot, aka Real Nemu, <sighs> and through a really intense Hence, revisualization scene, it's revealed that the high priest actually killed himself. I think that's a first for the series. It sure is a good thing someone else died too, so that someone could still be arrested. After all that, we get a speech about how the Defense Culpability Act is terrible, followed by an honestly kind of upsetting scene where Believe sends off the spirit of her husband. So to summarize, we have an unbelievably convoluted case where Maya is accused of two murders that doesn't even have the satisfaction of a good breakdown. Yep. Sure, that's fine. I like this absolutely horrendous case. It pisses me off. It's just that good. So good that I'm fighting the urge to throw myself off a bridge. The point is, everything in my life is amazing. I want to die. What? Then we move on to case number four, and... Boy. This case, starring Athena Sykes of Dual Destiny's Fane, is often cited as the very worst in this game. And for good reason. It's hard to watch at points. Blackwell is constantly berating and condescending to Athena after she literally saved his life. And the worst part is Athena is completely irrelevant in this game. She's probably one of the deepest characters in Ace Attorney history, and after all she did in Dual Destinies, to see her treated like this is rather upsetting. To be honest, turn about Storyteller is even more disconnected to the overall story than the second case. At least the magical turnabout had some semi-important bits of dialogue thrown in. Turnabout Storyteller, on the other hand, it's complete filler. And... Well... Well what? I kinda like it. Yeah, me too. Oh, okay, it's not just me. Yeah, this is probably the most filler case in all of Ace Attorney history, but it's still got some moments. Black Will, despite being a jerk, is a million flavors of fun because he is helping you win on the defense. Prosecutors in Ace Attorney, they're some dastardly sons of- 
so having one on your side is honestly quite the breath of fresh air. And another reason why we like this case, this guy. He is a one-man show, figuratively and literally. And it's worth mentioning, yeah, Athena did get her own case in spite of being unimportant and continuing to be unimportant for the rest of the game. This is Athena's role in the whole game, defending a drunk. Nice. These might be our only praises, but trust us, these positives more than balance out the negatives. The negatives, like figuring out the villain's method and her motivation. I killed him because he forced me to be a balloon artist. Seriously. 